see some some friends and, and uh, people I've known for many years, Frank Robinson, Linda Spaulding, who was a colleague at the Times Union for several years, uh, Greg Millette, and I see some other people I know. Uh, I thought I'd talk about some of the assignments I've had at the Times Union. I've been there since 1984. I've written thousands and thousands of articles, millions of words, and often, as a journalist, you have to go to tragic, catastrophic, bad situations. What I thought I'd talk about is how you find the humanity in often inhumane or uh, horrific situations. I was going to start with 9-11. Many of you might have been directly touched. I was uh, there by accident. I was going down in the morning, beautiful, warm, clear September morning to do a feature story on a local architectural firm, Wait Architects, uh, about the Tweed Courthouse restoration. And it became obvious on Amtrak, uh, the, it was on the 745 train, I think it was, and it became clear that uh, there was something terribly wrong in New York City, and at Yonkers, where you could see smoke pouring out of uh, the World Trade Center, we were told we were told by the conductor on the train to uh, either get off the train or continue on to New York, and they weren't sure what was going on, but they were ordered to clear the tracks and got into New York City at about a little before 10 a.m. shortly after the first tower fell, and uh, saw something. Um, that I never expected to see. Uh, an empty Penn Station at that hour in the morning was my first indication that something was terribly wrong. I got up to the street level. There were people hugging, crying, um, just kind of in a daze, and no taxis, no cars. It's a usual busy part of the city. Just people in the street walking uptown. And as a journalist, you know, you're, you're train to go to where the situation, where the story is. So I sort of got off to the side and walked down against the flow of people. As I got closer and closer below the 20s and below 14th Street, started seeing people covered in ash, people obviously traumatized, injured. And I started walking through ash and got closer and closer. And uh, for the next five days, we were at ground zero. My photographer, Steve Jacobs, who, who took these pictures, was able to get across on day number two, they ran a couple path trains from New Jersey. But for all of the rest of 9-11, uh, it was shut off. There was nobody coming in and out of the city. And I was there on this other story and covered this catastrophic story. And what I think the pictures convey, what I wanted to, to say was that in, in the worst moment of humanity, this, this you know orchestrated effort to inflict maximum harm and uh, in which nearly 3,000 people died. The best of humanity was quickly present. People started, you know, like me going against the flow. I saw a lot of firefighters, police officers who probably ended up giving their lives. You know, when people were trying to rush out of those buildings, they were rushing up the stairs. You've seen those images. And throughout the next five days, extraordinary uh, courage and um, humanity from people everything, just offering water, offering food. Uh, iron workers were going in en masse to pick over this burning, smoldering, as we know now, toxic and carcinogenic pile of rubble, trying to find survivors. All the people in the hospitals were on, you know, ready for massive casualties and trauma. Unfortunately, there weren't injured people and, and survivors from those towers, but they were ready um, for, for the next five days you know, an incredible outpouring. I still remember going to the press conference with Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki at about day four, and the message was, do not try to send any more help. The, the city was, was completely backed up for miles in all directions with water, medical supplies, food, all kinds of help. You know, the country and the world just wanted to wrap that, that stricken city in its arms. And what I saw was, time and time again, you know, set aside what was the worst of human nature, but people wanting to help, people wanting to, to be there, people wanting to offer comfort whenever they could. So this um, slideshow tries to depict some of that. Uh, 
how this horrible situation soon turned into something very moving um, and uh, heroic. So I'll play this for you. Steve Jacobs and I, um, 
and to see people of all ages, all races, all religions, all backgrounds in a peaceful setting. There was not one that we could see or in doing follow-up reporting at the inauguration, not one arrest for assault, for violence. It was an incredible crowd of a million people and, and you know, it could have been a terrible situation. You saw a little bit of it, the backlash against Muslim Americans, against the Middle Eastern people of Middle Eastern descent, but it was a peaceful, somber, powerful gathering of, of people, of humanity, not of religion per se. Um, so that experience was, was very moving. Uh, another assignment I went on, again with Steve Jacobs, we went to uh, Malawi in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to report on uh, the issue of AIDS. This was back in 2006, I believe. We looked at disease and, and the real suffering that was happening in this part of the world. Um, at the time, it hasn't gotten much better in the last six or seven years. At the time, the average lifespan there was 37 years old. Uh, most people got by on less than $200 a year. Widespread outbreaks of, of diseases that we've eradicated in this country, you know, 150 years ago, cholera, dysentery, um, other kinds of wasting diseases. Um, but again, what we found amid this hardship, amid this, you know, physical deprivation was, was kindness, was an overwhelming show of support, both from our region. We track people in the capital region um, who have gone to that part of the world, who have raised money for food and medical supplies and things. Um, and also the people themselves were, were joyful. There was a lot of singing and dancing. You know, they weren't letting um, the fact that they're one of the poorest nations in the world destroy their humanity and their human spirit. I'll read you two short pieces, kind of the beginning of this series, and then again I can show you a, a slideshow that, that you can see, you know, what we saw. Uh, we call this series the fourth world, because this part of the world is even below what we call the third world. When you look at um, the world economic rankings, they're always near the bottom in terms of health, education, capacity. It's a country that's been um, dominated and subjective by first the British, other colonial rulers, and its own corrupt politicians. And uh, you know the, the people of Malawi are a beautiful, peaceful, warm people, but they've just been kind of abused and, and uh, taken advantage of for 200 years. Um, so this was called Fourth World, Our World. We made the connection of people right here in the capital region helping them. Um, and this was the, the beginning of the series. There was a moment, perhaps a dozen years ago, when there seemed to be some hope for the nations of Sub-Saharan Africa. The world was on the brink of economic expansion. The geopolitical climate was shifting away from the confrontation of superpowers. Resources once uh, allocated for war preparations, it seemed, might be channeled instead into economic development. But then so many of the nations of Africa began a death spiral into the worst global pandemic since the Black Death. And America didn't seem to notice it shouldn't have come as a surprise. The United States had ignored Africa through most of its modern history. For a while during the Cold War, Washington put the continent on its strategic chessboard. But before, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, U.S. policymakers again lost interest in Africa. And that was when the scourge of age struck. For the price of a movie ticket and a Coke, for the one billion people who live in the first world, that is the industrialized nations, the march of age through sub-Saharan Africa could be slowed to a crawl. But we seem not to care that much about places few have heard of and even fewer could locate on a map. Take Malawi, for instance. Why should we care about this country in southeastern Africa, one of the poorest nations in the world? Unlike other African nations, 
Malawi has no oil, no resources, no gold, no valuable things that a wealthy nation might exploit. Malawi resides in the fourth world, so desperately poor, in such an utter state of collapse that it doesn't even rate being called a member of the undeveloped third world. The aid package to fight AIDS that President Bush signed into law last month will help 12 African countries, but Malawi, being so small and insignificant, was not one of them. There are some lifelines of hope, however. Individuals, organizations, particularly churches in the capital region, have seen the need and they're acting upon it. In reaching out to Malawi and other places in Africa, people are making extraordinary sacrifices. Some have dug deep into their own savings. Many have donated food and clothing. Others have given up vacation time or taken a leave of absence to go to Malawi to teach orphans, to build schools, to ease the suffering and the dying. All of them retain hope in the transformative power of one. They're planting seeds of redemption in a continent parched with despair. Why should we as Americans try to save Malawi? Because it is there, because it's a poor country in need, and because we can. And we spent almost three weeks going around the country, and again, we saw people who were giving deeply and sacrificing of themselves to help the most desperate people in need. And it, was, it was very uplifting, even though the situation, we saw children dying, young people dying of AIDS, we saw people starving, um, but it was still uplifting to see how people's humanity was moved to want to do something. This is one little vignette that I, I, I'll read to you. It's called Hope in a Can of Green Beans. We met several Americans and, and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, um, that were doing tremendous work and had been there for many years. We're going to be there for the long haul, despite our government often not making good on its promises. We didn't make good on the promise we made to Africa. We haven't made good on the promise we made to Haiti after the earthquake. We didn't completely make good on the promise after Hurricane Katrina. I'll be talking about those two as well. 2,000 hungry villagers have been sitting cross-legged in the red dirt for four hours, still as statues, pressed tightly, shoulder to shoulder, men on one side, women on the other. Word has spread that Americans will deliver food today to Medici, a village on the brink of starvation and reeling from a cholera outbreak a few days earlier. A flatbed, a flatbed truck drives up with cases of canned green beans sent by a U.S. donor. Susie Stevens of the Malawi Project arrives. Mama Susie, as the Malawians call her, receives a rock star's ovation. Men stand and applaud. Women make sharp trills with their tongues that sound like a melodic war whoop. The crowd parts and Mama Susie wades through. The throng queues up in long, orderly rows. Mama Susie begins passing out six pound, 10 ounce cans of crest top blue lake green beans, one can per person. Village elders stop her. They huddle, confer, and show her a list of 284 names, the most needy cases, mostly widows and orphans. Tradition dictates that the neediest are served first. The elders call out each name. There is a pause as each one moves to the front of the line. Just then, the skies let loose. A hundred battered umbrellas snap open. A monsoonal downpour turns the red dirt clearing into a lake, the consistency and color of butterscotch pudding. The lines say straight and orderly. Boys dig bugs from a muddy hillside and pop them into their mouths, their tattered clothes streaming with rainwater. A Malawi shower, they like to call it. There are enough green beans to give one can, one meal for a family, to less than half the crowd. The others return to their huts, wet and hungry. Let me show you this uh, slideshow from Malawi that Steve Jacobs 
were ordinary people doing amazing things to try to help. You can see the devastation everywhere. Oh, 